Um, before we begin, it would be great uh, as we go through the morning um, if you can uh, you know, put out some stuff on Twitter. It's always, always a, a real challenge for people because there's four sessions, five sessions going on at the same time and you wonder what's going on in the other, in the other track. So you know, if you can share what you, what you pick up over the next hour with uh, all the other conference delegates, that would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to crack on. And um, I'd encourage you to think about as well the bridge. So Don's spoken about it a, a few times over the, the course of the two days. Uh, and really, we want you to commit to something, taking something that you learn over the next hour back into the workplace tomorrow to do something differently, whether that be with your clients uh, or whether it be in your, in your organisation. So um, without further ado, please give a, a warm welcome to Mike Taylor. Thanks, Kenny. Are we, you hear me in the back, everything's on? Okay, cool. So th first of all, thanks for coming. I wasn't sure with all the other great sessions that are happening right now, it wasn't gonna just be me and the AV guys having a little chat, so thank you. Um, I've been doing curation for over 15 years, probably longer than I care to admit. When I started, I didn't even really think of it as curation. I, uh, I'm not sure I even knew that term and definitely not in this context. It started, the first thing that I can remember doing curation that we would all call curation was I went to a new work group in my company and I was sort of the younger, more tech savvy sort of person in our group of some older folks. And I just thought I would get questions and my lens was, okay, well, if this person has a question, there are probably multiple other people have the same question, so I'm gonna start sharing one answer a week. So I started with an email Every Friday, a little short, here's a question I got this week, here's the answer, other people can do it. Saved all the archives in a Lotus Notes database, so it can tell you how long ago it was, you kind of see. So the point is, we're gonna talk about some tools, but it's not really about the tools. It's a, it's a process and an approach. So the tools don't really matter, and you can probably do it with whatever tools you have, so you don't need to go out and buy a platform or a system or any of that kind of stuff. Now those can help depending on your constraints, your situation, but really it's more the mindset than the tools. So if you wanna grab this, if you have questions, I'm gonna to try to pop this up at the end if we have time. So you can do this on your phone, your laptop or whatever you have available and uh, drop questions in here. If you don't have any questions, you can vote for other people's questions. So we'll upvote those and we'll try to save some time if we can at the end to, to get those addressed. So I have had a really great experience, been very lucky. I worked in a Fortune 100 company, utility company, so slow moving, not really technologically out front. I spent a couple years as a community manager at Articulate, so total opposite end of the scale, virtual company, very agile, very technical, technically savvy. And I'm ending a t uh, four years at a startup in Columbus now. Next Friday is my last day, so I'm getting ready to launch to whatever appears next. So I've been really fortunate to have this really broad set of experiences in a bunch of different contexts. I've also got, and I'm gonna put this up at, at the end, so everything I show here, I'm gonna give you another thing, a, a chance at the end to grab this, so don't feel like you have to furiously scribble notes. I'll give you a place and I'll send it all to you if you want it. I'll send you the slides, I'll send you the notes. Uh, I put together this workbook uh, for a couple workshops that I've done, and it's just got some prompts and some questions that I think are helpful as you think about your curation. Who's the audience? Who's it for? What are your goals? That sort of stuff. And it's just, I think, a helpful guide. So you can get that from my website, and like I said, I'll give you a chance at the end to grab that, and I'll send it to you. So let's start off with, with what is curation? Does anybody have a good example that the, or a definition that they like? He says, don't pick on me, don't pick on me. <laughs> Anyone? Nobody? Yes? Using content, reusing content that is already there. Reusing content, yeah, right, absolutely. Anybody else have one they like? Yes? I like uh, Harold Garvey's model of seek, sense, share, find useful content, open down, share it. Yeah, so he's talking about Harold Jarkey has a really nice, useful model, which we're going to see more of. Uh, seek, sense, share, we're going to talk about that. The one that I've found that I really like 
Is curation using your expertise in a field to gather great content around a specific theme and present that content in a way that will educate others? Cliff Notes version, gather great content that educates others. I really like that. I think that speaks well to everybody. So if you're having conversations with bosses and stakeholders, this is maybe a good one to use because I think that resonates, it's pretty clear. How many people here are interested in curating just sort of on a personal basis? Nobody. <laughs> one brave soul. We'll talk about that a little bit. What, so everybody else here is organizational. Makes the second part of that question really easy. I'm a big believer that we should do it for ourselves first. You know, they tell you on the airplane, place your mask on your child first. Or, or yourself first before you do your child. Uh, <laughs> They're not going to save us, probably, not my kids. But anyway, I think there's a lot of value and things that you can learn from doing it for yourself. You, you can you're, play, experiment, find the bugs, find the, stuff, find the stuff that works, and then apply it to your audience. So personal opinion. Why do we curate? If you think about it, I think curation, we're already doing a form of curation in a lot of what L&D and what training departments do. So if you think about courses, we do some analysis, we set some goals up front, we get this big pile of data and we've got to pare it down. Then we create, collaborate, something comes out of that product. We deliver it, publish it, whatever form that takes. Some people measure, hopefully. Many fewer people get to this last step. Did anybody have a process of reviewing your e-learning courses in your LMS? Is it annually, maybe? Is it, anybody have it less than annually? Yes, few people. So, so that's the exception. A lot of times, courses get into LMS, and they're there forever. You know, the courses go there, and they're just stored. So this, this maintain, expire, destroy thing, I think, is, is an important part that a lot of e-learning and traditional stuff doesn't get to. But if we, if we turn to curation, really, the big main steps are still the same. We have this big amount of stuff. We're paring it down. We're targeting to an audience. We want to measure to see what works and what doesn't work. And I think in the curation content, this maintain, destroy, refresh, it's just built into the process it's expected. So why are we going to, why are we going to curate? There's a bunch of reasons. I think these are some of the, the top ones that I think of. We could be here all day probably coming up with other reasons. But just keeping yourself current and your content, your organization, Helping others identify trends, where are things going, being at the front edge of that, obviously gathering resources, whichever way you're going to use those. Supplement and enhance things you're already doing. So Kenny mentioned the silver bullet. I'm not proposing this or anything else as a silver bullet. Start finding the right balance and how can you use curation to make whatever else you're doing better work more efficiently, cut down on the need to develop new content. If there's first aid course that somebody else has built and they're offering to share it, why would I build a new one if it's, if it's appropriate? And then this one I think is, is really one of the biggest values to me personally, it's just getting outside of your bubble, right? So what are people doing in other companies? What are people doing in other fields? And there's a lot of value in just putting your head up and scanning the horizon for what's happening. Uh, Jane Hart talked about this in her session yesterday. So this is her annual survey, and these are not L&D people. These are the people in the workplace that we're serving. Uh, if you see down here at the very, very bottom of the list, they don't like that e-learning and workshop very much. They're not finding it valuable. So these numbers, the percentages come from people who rate this as very important or essential. That's a lot of what Many training departments do, L&D departments, but people don't really love it. What they like are up here at the top. And if you take a look at web search, web resources, knowledge sharing, this is curatable stuff. It's not formal. It's non-designed. So that's the kind of stuff that they're valuing. So there's value in doing this whole curation thing. Robin Good is another sort of super curator. And I like how he, he sort of frames this. We all have this overload of information. 
and, and people value and appreciate experts who can give us these intellectual binoculars. I love that term. If we think about curation versus typical training and workshops and online courses, it, you come to this concept of stock versus flow. So if we compare the two options, you know, we were talking that courses are outdated quickly. They're pretty close and isolated. You get what you get mostly. There's no dynamic, there's no updates, there's no conversation around that. Curation, you'll see here in a minute, like this can be connected to other people and it's, it's sort of a living, breathing sort of thing at times if you do it well. Courses are much slower, expensive, right? They take a long time to build compared to, to being able to curate flexibility and cost. So I said free with an asterisk. Obviously there's some time involved, but when compared to, to traditional course building stuff, I can, I can do it for free or super inexpensively. So here's what I'm talking about. Typical, typical process is, is in L&D we create a lot of stuff. We generate a lot of content. I asked the question, how did that stuff get refreshed? Typically not very fast. Once a year, maybe never in many cases. And I think we can all relate that as the pace of change in our companies and in our lives is getting faster and faster, the time period when we publish that static course remaining relevant is getting shorter and shorter. It's getting outdated faster and faster. So if we think about our process, the first thing, even when we do publish the best course in the world, most people don't really know about it unless there's anybody here who checks their LMS every day for a new course. You can just check yet today, nobody does that. So the first thing that we can do to kind of improve the whole process is send some sort of a signal that they can opt into, say they can receive only what's relevant to them. So if they're a safety professional, I've got a new safety content, I want you to ping me, I don't want to go look every day for the new stuff. That's a huge thing. Really simple, but really huge. The second piece that it does, I was, I was talking about getting outside your bubble, and there's a lot of smart people in your company, and it doesn't matter how many smart people are there, there's more outside your company. Doesn't matter what your company is, that's true for everyone. So now, with curation, I can start to pull in this external knowledge, and ideally, we would like to make this shareable, easily shareable, so if I find something value, that Haimo, I think he's gonna really like that and know that, I can easily send him a, a note or a link or something and he can access it easily without having to log into the LMS, do all that sort of stuff. So it's reducing friction. And what that enables is the conversation around our content. So it's not this is the rule, take it or leave it, that's it. So now we're opening things up to conversation. Even when I do e-learning courses, I always build in some communication method, and I found, hey, there's a typo on page three, hey, this policy, there's this gray area, I'm not sure this is what you meant, so you can clarify it. So there's always value, in my experience, in, in being able to have those conversations around the content. And then, the cool thing is, it all comes back full circle, so now I'm having these conversations, I can make the content better, I'm doing some co-creation, with others, maybe I didn't even know they existed and they're giving me this great information, or maybe I'm not creating at all, I found some source where I can curate that and spend my time a little bit more efficiently and effectively. So what we have is now, instead of just a stock of e-learning course that's static, now we have this flow of information, and as I do that, and as I have conversations, I can continually try to refresh that knowledge that we're sharing with our audience. So participating in those relevant flows is what enables us to do that. And this is a consideration, so even if you're not doing curation and you're in an L&D department, I think this is an important thing to consider. Where's my content and is it, is it shareable, is it free, is it locked down? So we can sort of tilt the odds in our favor, so those serendipitous connections, if it's locked in an LMS and somebody in another part of the company doesn't even have access, right, like that's the opposite of what we want to happen. 
I like this sentiment from uh, Mark Britz. And he's saying that organizations can't scale if there's only a few of us creating the official content. And in order to do that at scale and quickly at the pace that we're going to need it to happen, is we should have many people creating and consuming learning together. And curation fits into that really nicely. And this goes to learning agility. So we've heard a lot about that. We heard about some of it this morning in the keynote about how things are changing. The comp average shelf life of companies is, is shrinking. 90% of the Fortune 500 from 1955 is gone. There's, there's all kinds of statistics. Uh, time spent on the S&P 500 is dropping. Next 10 years, 50% of the S&P 500 is gone. So these are major, fast-changing things that are happening. Jack Welch, former chairman and CEO of, of GE, he said this a long time ago. It's, it's been relevant for a, wrong, a long time. This is not a new development. So an organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. I want to get t-shirts printed up. That's, that's Don's walk-off charge for all of us. That learning matters. It's really important stuff. And whether all of our stakeholders, believe it or not, we're really key parts of, of success in our companies. So a little bit about how it all works. There's, there's one sort of clarification I want to make before we get much further along, and it's aggregation versus curation. Does anybody have a definition for aggregation versus curation? What's the difference? Specific. Specificness, right? Selection. Selection. Yeah, so to me, aggregation is, is often an automated thing. Stick in some keywords, you get back this big flood of stuff. Um, curation is more manual. There's a human involved. So maybe that's one of the skills uh, Daniel was talking about in the keynote this morning that aren't maybe robot replaceable. That would be good for us. So aggregation, like I said, obviously typically keyword driven. It's really fast and you can cover a lot of territory, a lot of sources, but the challenge is there's no quality check, there's no context. Um, the signal to noise ratio is not really good. So there's a place for it. I wouldn't rely on it totally. It doesn't have the, the context that we need for our audience. If we compare it, you may have seen, if you're on Twitter, you may have seen people who have nothing but a whole Twitter page of these automated updates. And as soon as I see that, I just go away because there's no value in all of this automated stuff. If we look at curation, good curators are, are building their practice around important questions about why are we doing this? What are our goals? Who is it for? Who are the people on the other end? What do they need? And so it takes a little bit more time, but I'm a big believer that it is an investment of time that you get back and not a waste of time or not an expense of time. Let's us check for quality context, ver verify certain things. And it's a lot more flexible. I can send things where I want, when I want, how I want, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So ideally, we want to sort of find a sweet spot that sort of marries the most of these things. We'll take the best of both. We want to try to leverage some efficiencies, but we want to keep the human element to keep the quality. And that's the whole idea is more signal, less noise. We all probably have some favorites. Anybody have a favorite sort of curated content that you get? Do you have one? Uh, I didn't pay him to say it. Anybody else? Uh, in, the, in the US, it's started to get popular that people are curating the news. So they'll just get little short little snippets of here's what's happening. I don't have to wade through all of the depressing, scary things. And I get a nice curated newsletter. Anybody have anything like that that they really like? Value? You have one? Yes? Maybe not. OK, so we'll keep going. Uh, here are a couple in our space. He mentioned Harold Jarkey earlier. Really fabulous. He does this every two weeks. And he just shares things that he's found valuable. And they're fantastic. Jane Hart, obviously, she was here speaking yesterday morning. 
her modern workplace newsletter, it's in my A list. Like it's things that when it comes out, I'm definitely going to read that. I'm not going to skip those. David Kelly, he's also here. He does one weekly as well. And, and this is nice. These people are just scanning our industry, what's happening, what's relevant, and trying to surface some of the, the things they feel is more important. I do one every Friday as well, similar kind of process. I read a lot every morning. I flag those for Friday, the top five, and a bunch of other stuff go out. So how do we get started? This is, I think, a common challenge, is there's a lot of talk and it's a big buzzword. Well, what does that mean? What do I do? Where, where, what button do I push? How do I get started? So it's really, in theory, it's really simple. You find a whole bunch of great stuff, and you share them. All right, we're done. That's it. it was, <laughs> right? Simple. In theory. When it comes down to putting it into practice and making it happen, it's a little bit less simple. So we have these questions like, okay, where do I go to find the content? Where do I go to look for it? How do you find the good stuff versus the not so good stuff? Where's the best stuff? How do you find the time to do it well? And then what do you do once you have it? What do you do with it? Oh, this is fantastic for me. How do I provide it and share it with others? So similar to what we saw before with curation being similar to courses, Hopefully, we're starting with a goal. That's probably not a very controversial statement. That's going to lead us to some relevant topics to support the goal. That's going to take us the next step to find those very good sources that are going to give us the topics to meet our goal. This is where we come in as curators. So we're going to process this. We're going to identify, verify, uh, add some value where we can and then we're going to share it. So similar to what we're already doing, again, with courses and workshops and, and all the other instructional design process, here is the, I always love Cliff Notes version, right? Everybody, nobody wants to read anything. This is the Cliff Notes version of the rest of the talk. So three questions. If you want to like, how do you find good stuff? You have to consider your audience. Who are those folks? What are they doing? And these are three questions I think will get you pretty far towards curation success. First one is, what are their goals and pain points? What kind of information do they want? And I think oftentimes the most valuable things that I learn fall under this awareness piece. I learned something I didn't even know I needed to know, and that's the best learning for me personally. This is amazing. I never even had the thought. I don't know how I'll live without it now. So goals and pain points, information they want, awareness they need. If you can answer those three questions with the things you're curating, you're going to be doing pretty well. Anybody relate to that? Feel the, the fire hose of, of information? I think that's pretty common. Back to Harold Jarkey, he, so he has this system. He runs some wonderful workshops online. He has what he calls personal knowledge mastery, this set of, of individually constructed processes. And that's important when I say individually constructed processes. In a bit, I'll show you my process. That may or may not work for you. Probably not going to work exactly. You may be able to take, and it's a very personal thing. There's a lot of factors that go into finding the process uh, that works best for you. So, you know, I don't think there's probably anybody here who doesn't want to do this, you know, make sense of the world and work better, work more effectively. So his model, as we heard earlier, it's the seek, sense, share. First part is seeking. How do we get it? How do we find it? Uh, important part of that is how do we get it efficiently? Because we could sit here on our computers for 10 hours a day and find great stuff, but none of us have the luxury, I'm guessing, if you do, let me know. We'll talk later. <laughs> and if you're hiring, that would be great. Um, the middle part, the sense part, this is where we're processing, verifying, is it a reputable source? Is it relevant? Adding value where we can. And then the last part is share. So we're going to do something with it. Email it, post it, publish it. Hopefully there's some action in the end. And that's Harold Jarkey's model. So 
That's the asterisk there. I'm, I'm giving Harold credit for his work. So let's dig into the first part a little bit, the seek part. Discovery and efficiency, I think, are the two important parts in this step. So if you think back, I'm old enough to remember back when this whole web thing was new. And I remember the first time I went in my Netscape browser on the internet, and I found these fabulous, wonderful, this is amazing, just the best stuff ever, right? And then by about day two or three, oh my gosh, it's too much stuff. You can't process it all. It's just overwhelming, and, and you get this feeling like, I, I'm so frustrated because I can't, it's now the signal to noise, it's, it's too high. It's not working anymore. I'm overloaded. So this step is where we're going to look at how are we getting that information, how are we taking it in. And it's a really important and game-changing thing if we think about it. Instead of going to websites, has anybody here ever visited a website, you're looking to see if something's new and there's nothing new, just wasted trip? A lot of people have done that. I hate that. So the first thing to do is take those arrows and point them and have information come to us instead of us going to get things. So that's the first part. The second part, and I love this quote, it's not information overload, it's filter failure. So we have to tune our filters to get the signal that we want to receive, just like the radio. If you get on the wrong station, you tune it to a different one to get what you're looking for. So if we can apply a filter so we only receive the stuff we want and tune those filters, now we can reduce all of this extra stuff I don't care about down to a manageable size and it's coming to me so we're orders of magnitude more efficient with the information we're consuming and we're doing it a lot more smart. Think about how many inboxes we have these days. We all, anybody have less than six? We all probably have 10, 20, whatever. We've got a lot of those. So another part of that process is, you know, how can we consolidate some of that stuff, bring it into a single place, and reduce the number of places we're looking? So that concept's also at work here. Is anybody familiar with this term RSS? A few folks. So really simple syndication, rich site, doesn't really matter what, what it means. It's just a technology. Uh, it's sort of one of those behind the scenes things. A lot of people say that and they'll look at you like you're from another planet. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just a format for delivering content that changes on the web. So I don't have to go and look. Nothing new wasted. I don't have to do that anymore because whenever there's something new, it comes to me when I choose to, to receive it. There's a bunch of options for this. I think Outlook even has one built in if you're doing internal stuff. I don't use any of those. When I, like Feedly, is any Feedly users? A couple of Feedly, yeah, fantastic. Uh, Flipboard is another one. If anybody uses Flipboard, a few Flipboard people. So this is like I'm building my own information ecosystem of what I want to consume. Feedly has been the best one that I have found through years and years of trial that works the best. We'll see a little bit about it. So I'm getting things to come to me. It's free if you want to add on Team sharing, and there's additional things that you can pay, you know, five or eight dollars a month. I'm on the free version, so depends on, on what you need. Works everywhere, phone, tablet, desktop. So when you're in the coffee line, you can check that. It's all going to sync to your desktop when you get to the office or at home. Really, really nice. This is what it looks like. So this is a page. You can customize this view if you want a list view, or there's three or four or five different options. When I want to add something, a little button there, I can just type in a website. So if I want to follow the articulate updates, drop it in. Or I can do more of like a Google-like search where I can search for curation or e-learning or whatever my topic is. This is a really nice feature that you'll see on every page. So whatever I'm reading, it's going to give me some suggested things. It's sort of like the Amazon model. Hey, you're reading this. You might also like to read these. There's some value there. This is the things I didn't even know existed that I'm going to discover that are related to what I'm already interested in. So really, really nice to have that discovery. And then once you get past a handful of things you're trying to keep up with, you can organize them and separate them out. It could be topic, it could be professional versus personal, some type of segregation 
between all of these feeds. So for me, I have a, I have a small list of sort of what I call my A-list feeds. I read those every day. If I have a few extra minutes, I get to my B list. And then maybe on the weekends I have more time, I have all the rest. Sometimes I get to all the rest, I hit mark all this red and start over because I don't care. My A and B list are my primary things. So it lets you do that and keep focus. So like I said, that's a really helpful. It has a browser, some browser plugins. So this really even streamlines the process a little bit further. If I'm on a website, oh, this is great stuff, I want to follow it, click a button and I've, and I've followed it. Click a button, put it in a folder, and I go on without my day. I come back to it, it's waiting for me tomorrow morning or whenever I get to it. So super nice efficiency. To me, this is re it's really like magic. I can keep up with so much stuff. I looked about uh, two days ago. I'm subscribed to 759 sources. Doesn't mean that I read all 759 sources every day, but at some point, um, there's 759 in there. I might be due for you know, house cleaning to see what things die. It's just like a garden. You have to go in and you have to weed out the stuff that's dead. So it gives you an idea of the scale of how you can consume and take in information. If we get to the second step, so the sense step where we're verifying, organizing, we need to save it so I can find it later, that type of stuff. Anybody here use social bookmarks for anything? Do you even know what I'm talking about? What is a social bookmark? It's a bookmark that goes to parties. So this is, how many people here keep favorites in your browser, bookmarks in your browser? Pretty much everybody, right? So this is really, I think, if you want to do one step that you can leave today and start down a curation path, is you can do this social bookmarking. So I use a, a tool called Digo, D-I-I-G-O. Pinterest is a form of this. There's a bunch. There's all kinds. So why would we put our bookmarks online? Or would we? So this is a really super easy way to start sharing organizational knowledge. People can follow the things that I'm bookmarking. I follow Harold, when, Harold Jarkey. When he does a bookmark, I'm probably interested in it because he finds really great stuff. The cool thing is there's a feed for those bookmarks. I can read it in Feedly, and it's in my single inbox, so it all sort of connects really nicely. But among the things that I can do with these type of bookmarks is if I save a bookmark on my computer, A, if my computer dies, I lost it. Or if it's on my computer at home and I'm at work, I can't get to it. So access is a really big thing if it's online. The other thing is when I save a bookmark, it, I can only put it in one folder. And there may be something that could be under e-learning, could be design, could be workplace, could be all these things. I have to pick one and put in a folder. If I use this social bookmarking, now I can tag them. So I can put as many tags on something I want. It makes it easier to find. I can use that tagging. If I want to find all the things related to a particular topic, I click on the tag, I get that list. So it's a really nice dynamic process. Discovery I talked about, I can see other people's. What are they bookmarking around? A, I could follow the, everything from a person, just a particular tag, all the people in the world who are tagging things with that topic and then I can follow those people. So this is super, super easy, doesn't require a hole in the firewall, typically, doesn't require IT approval. You can sign up today and you can start today. Import your existing ones, you don't even have to, to resave them, there's a nice import process, and you're off and running. So you organize yourself, share with others, follow smart people. Pretty big, I think pretty simple, easy, big win, right off the bat. And this is the tool that I use. So it's called Digo. We talked about the online bookmarking piece. We talked about tags and lists. I can search this from anywhere in the world. Doesn't matter if I have my devices or not. I can search it from somebody else's computer. I can also do this collaboratively. So if I have a team of people that I want to contribute to this curated list, we can manage that and we can, we can do it as a team-based thing. It also has some additional, you can highlight, take notes, that's sort of some additional secondary thing which are also helpful. One of the things I do, I teach workshops, like certification workshops, and I always share resources for those. I put them on a 
page in a group so that I always have one link to give. I give them the link to that page. Never changes. Every workshop I give to, same link. If somebody was in a workshop last week and I add new resources this week, when they visit the page, they get everything. So I don't have to keep sending new links and, and keeping track of that stuff. So it's really, really nice even for you know, workshop and classroom type stuff. It looks something like this. This is one of the pages that I share. You can see the setup. The tags are in the little gray boxes underneath. So if I'm teaching a storyline workshop and I want to show examples of animation, pull it up, click the animation tab, that's my set. Really, really nice dynamic way to do that. Feedly also has this function built in as well. So they call them boards. So as I'm reading, I can save things to, to a board within Feedly. So when I'm reading in the morning and I want to put something in my newsletter, I have a Friday newsletter board. When it comes time Thursday night to, to write it out, I just go to that board and everything's waiting for me. So the functionality is built into Feedly as well. I don't have to bookmark things to a Feedly board and be in Feedly. I can be anywhere on the web. So with the browser plugin, it doesn't matter what site I'm on. If you have the mobile app, I could be on Twitter, I could be on my mobile phone, and I can still send them to those Feedly boards. So that's super, super nice. It's connected from everywhere. Really, really nice feature. So you get to click a button. Which board do you want to put it to? Less than two seconds. So we've talked about Digo. Pocket is another form. There's about you know, a million of these things. Articulate does a really nice job curation. Their weekly challenges. David Anderson is a fabulous curator of the Articulate e-learning stuff. Zeef is one that I use for sort of more permanent collections. It's, it's a little more designed, a little more visual. I can put these things into categories. So I'm trying to serve them up to the audience a little bit nicer. It's also a web page sort of look and feel. And this is one that I've been playing with lately. Has anybody here used Trello? Huge Trello. I love Trello. You know, I found this little browser button where I can click the button. It pulls the title, pulls the image, and it's pre-built. And then I can use the list to organize things. So I thought that was a pretty creative solution for curation when I found it. And I'm playing with it. And I'm really liking it. So the point is, there's tons of ways to do it. Obviously, Evernote, OneNote is another way to, to keep track of things that you're doing. Uh, there's no right or wrong way. It's going to be very personal. I would say start where you are and go from there. Don't worry about finding the perfect system right off the bat. At the end, so after we've done the first two steps, now we're going to do, do sharing here. And I think this is a really valuable thing. Kind of we talked about how knowledge can flow earlier. But these sharing spaces are a really simple way that we can accelerate the learning that's happening. So a lot of times when we're learning something, we're trying to get up that learning curve. I, I can't really shorten what I need to know to be proficient or be an expert. But what I can do is I can shorten the time that it takes to do it. So if I don't have to make all the mistakes and learn all the lessons myself and I can learn them from other people, I'm going to compress the time that it takes to get up that learning curve. And that's important, as we've heard this morning in the keynote, because we're probably going to have to keep learning and learning and learning new things over time. Hopefully, we're all in the field that we're in. We never stop learning. It's not an issue for us. We need to help the people that, that we're serving. Anybody read any of Kathy Sierra? She is, used to be a Silicon Valley. Uh, she's fabulous. She has a fabulous book. It's about users, but it's super applicable to training and learning. My all-time very favorite chart. I'm not a fan of charts. This is my all-time favorite one. So this is how to be an expert. A lot of people start out, oh, I can't do this, they give up. Because they couldn't get past the suck threshold. <laughs> oh, I suck at this, I quit. If they keep going a little bit longer, this is where there's a large portion of people live. OK, I can do this. I'm good, I'm going to cruise. No worries, I'm good. But what we want to do is we want to get people past the kick-ass threshold. We want people to do better than just good enough. So these are the people who are looking, I know there's a better way, I know there's a quicker way, more efficient way. 
And it, it, this getting up to that area is infinitely more easy when I'm doing it with someone else and not myself. I don't like many charts. That's my favorite. Within Feedly, so the sharing part within Feedly, every article has buttons here at the top. Where do I want to send it? I want to email it. I want to Twitter, LinkedIn. This is somewhat customizable. Some, most of them are free. Some are a paid version, five bucks a month-ish. It's, it's inexpensive. It's, it's worth it. So when you go in, part of the setup is what sharing buttons do you want? Every single post has those. So to share is a click. Click, add a note, whatever, whatever your process looks like. 82 million bazillion options for sharing. I'm sure everybody's probably pretty aware of that. Some of the saving, like Digo, that's a saving and a sharing if I make it public. So some of those sort of do both functions. Pinterest is saving and sharing for other people. So some of these do a bit of double duty. Tons of website options, blog options, really nice newsletters. I'm a big proponent of using some marketing email platforms in a learning context. Fantastic, I think, opportunity for us. It works well for learning content. So here are some of the sort of the key considerations. Depending on who you ask, I'm either really lazy or I'm really efficient. Efficient sounds a lot better. But I don't want to get in the process of, hey, can you add me to your subscription list? Hey, can you take me off? I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. So as you're thinking about this, consider your administrative time and headaches and all that sort of stuff. So look for something that's an efficient process. I'm guessing all of us here probably have other jobs to do in addition to, to our curation efforts. So we want to keep it efficient. And to that point, make it easy for people to subscribe or unsubscribe. Let them do it themselves. You know, marketing email letters are perfect for that. Forward to a friend, unsubscribe. Let it do itself. And then a searchable, accessible archive is really important, I think. You know, a lot of times I curate stuff for myself because I know I'm going to need it. And then next week or next month or next year, like, I know I did that article somewhere. How can I find it and use it? In my original example, the, the first curation when I first started, you know, I sent the emails and say, oh, I, and then I get people, you sent that thing six months ago. I, now I need it. Where is it? I would say, no problem. I have searched it in the database, send them the link. Right, so that sort of stuff is really nice to, to consider. So a little peek into my personal process. I'll sort of tell you some of the tools and, and thought process. Again, some of these may work for you, some may not. It's, it's, it's a very personal process. So Feedly, as we've been talking about, that's my hub. That's where I'm intaking. 90% of the things I, I take in is all running through Feedly. The, the nice thing about Feedly, that I want to just sort of make clear is it doesn't have to be social media high-tech stuff. It could be news, the New York Times or the Telegraph or whatever, YouTube videos. There are some nice automation tools, IFTT, Zapier, where I can maybe I mark a video on YouTube to watch later, but then I can pipe that and it comes to Feedly. So it's really coming from multiple places to, to a single point. So really, really easy ways to do that with some of those automation tools. These are the main ones that I use to sort of save and keep track and organize. As we saw some of the examples, obviously I'm sharing with these as well, so they're doing a bit of double duty. As I'm reading in the morning or whenever I'm maybe in this line at Starbucks, wherever the opportunities present myself, I share a lot of things to Twitter and LinkedIn. One aspect of curation that is a nice bonus personally is if you're sharing valuable content with people, you're building your personal credibility. So I'm not writing the articles, but I'm finding them and giving value to others. And you're building your personal credibility so I can say, hey, he shares great stuff. He knows what he's talking about. And so there's some personal benefit in that as well. I read my window of opportunity to read is early in the morning before kids and dogs and everything starts running around and going crazy. So I read really early in the morning. If I just send it all to Twitter, only people like in Russia would see it because of the time zones. So there's a really nice tool called Buffer. Anybody here use Buffer? 
one person. So this is really, really handy. I will queue things in Buffer in the morning so I can do, if it's a really good day and a really rich set of content, I can send about two days worth of stuff to share and then it will drip that out over time. I've had people ask me, oh, you sent that tweet at two o'clock in the morning, don't you ever sleep? Well, yeah, I was asleep, it wasn't me, it was Buffer. So being, again, being smart, being efficient, how we're sharing. Every once in a while there's something that I think just needs a bigger treatment, it needs more depth, more detail. That'll be a blog post on my website. As I've gone through the week, I, I mentioned earlier I do my newsletter. So every Friday morning, this is what I'll be doing tonight to send out tomorrow's newsletter. It'll be a lot of the stuff that happened here. I have my website is connected with a MailChimp, so it runs itself. Somebody wants to subscribe, they do it themselves. They want to unsubscribe, same thing. And it's all connected. So I publish the post, typically 6 or 7 a.m. MailChimp looks every Friday at 8 a.m. Anything new, send it out. So it's really it's one step to do multiple functions. And I've mentioned the browser plugins a few times. Again, this is an efficiency thing. I live a lot in my browser. I think most people probably do as well. We spend a lot of time in our browsers. I don't want to have to do a copy paste, open some new app, do a bunch of extra stuff. So these are two clicks or less and I'm sending the stuff where I want it to go. So my particular browser, that's the Feedly. I can subscribe to a new feed. These, I'm going to save them different things in different places. So I might hit one of these buttons, give it a tag, give it a title, whatever data I want to go with it. And then that's the buffer button. So if I'm reading a really good article I want to share to um, social media or something like that. So it's a really you ideally can find this sort of curation control panel. Everything is right at your fingertips. Makes it super easy. Small bit of time to set it up up front. And you earn that back many times over, over time. How are we on time? Good. Uh, so here's some sort of top tips and then maybe we'll have some discussion and ask some questions. Uh, things that I have found that work for me and I'm pretty confident will work for you if you want to do that. You can get a big head start if you curate the curators. They're already covering a whole bunch of ground, so leverage what they're doing. Don't steal it from them, give them credit where you get it from obviously, but that's a great place. Curate the curators. Strive for 25. I think if you can find 25 good sources on a particular topic, you'll have a strong base of content. Obviously there's a variety of factors of how often they publish that sort of thing. So 25 is not a hard fast number, but it's a good, good rule of thumb that will work well. So it's not, I don't have to find 759, so don't be intimidated. Look for the add-ins, the plugins, use the mobile apps, use the browser plugins. Help us be efficient and be smart about it. One thing I don't think a lot of people realize is a lot of services, if there's not a plugin, you can email things to a ton of places. I can email bookmarks to Digo. I can email notes to Evernote. So if you ever need, oh, I can't find something, a lot of them will have email as a, another channel to get content there. Mobile apps we talked about. You know, it's nice to I'm in the line at Starbucks. I have five minutes. I can check in. I can share. And as I've been saying throughout this stuff, just be ruthlessly efficient. You know, the other, other thing that I do when I subscribe to things, one good post does not make a subscription worthy source. So I actually have a, a probation folder. So I have to see something good. If it's not obviously Jane Hart or somebody like that who's obviously going to be a, a long term thing, I'll put them in the probation folder. And if I see things in there over a couple of weeks or whatever the time frame is, then I'll move them where it goes. If not, then they just go out because I, I want to keep it keep it clean and keep that signal to noise ratio high. And this may be the most important times, put it on your calendar. Look for the windows of time that you have. If you're riding the bus or riding the train, perfect time. 
if you spend 10 or 15 minutes a day, it's amazing how that compounds and adds up over time. Maybe a little bit longer windows on the weekend, depending on you know, what your schedule is like. But just block time for it, because if you don't, it won't happen. It's like anything else. I mentioned the workbook. I'm going to give you a page here in a second where you can get the download link, all the resources. If you want a copy of the slides, just reply to the note that you get, and I'll, I'm happy to send them to you. So in the workbook, as I mentioned earlier, it's just some prompting questions, some place to take some notes. What are your goals? We all probably already have trusted sources that we are go-to resources to start with. One of the things that I think a lot, a lot of people do is they always think online sources. This site, that site, this newsletter. But it's really important to think of people. So if you see a keynote or you read a book, go look them up. They probably have a Twitter feed. They probably have a website. They probably have a newsletter. So go off of people, and you're, you're going to find a lot more focused, great, relevant content. And just don't forget the people. Like always, that's sort of good. <clears throat> Part of the downloads here, I've got a little ebook that's got some more resources, uh, tools, articles, content curation articles. And if you drop your email at that web address, I'll send it to you. It comes right away. If you have a question, if you want a copy of the slides, whatever the case, you'll have my email. Just reply. Happy to take questions. Happy to talk about it. If there's any way I can help you. How much time we got for questions? We have, yeah, we've got about 18 minutes left. Perfect. Awesome. So that's, that's everything I have. I'm going to look if anybody put any questions on the site here. Kenny will circulate here. Anybody have questions, comments, anything? Nothing. We put everybody so, to sleep, so, and so, they so I've got one question. don't ask a question. It's lunchtime. We're trying to get to lunch. Yeah. So I've got one question, uh, Mike. Which you you mentioned earlier. Um, you don't need IT approval, um, and I guess that's probably something that that few people here are, are sitting maybe wondering. You know, yeah. in my organisation, there are so many barriers to you know, doing this stuff. Typically, what are the barriers that, that you find people come across, and, and what's the best way around them? You, you mean specifically IT-type barriers, or just, just in general? IT, cultural? Well, I think, there, I think there, culturally, there are some organizations that think if we didn't create it, it's not valuable. Yeah. There's that, you know, we're, everybody thinks they're unique. Probably there are very few people who are as unique as they think they are. Yeah. Um, so if it's not built here, it's not valuable is, is one of the cultural challenges. I think generally, um, over time, if you think about big leaps forward, it's often not new things. It's a combination from two different areas. You know, you, they have technology here, technology here. You put them together, and it leapfrogs forward. So I, I think it's important to get outside of the bubble. And the mo I think the most important thing is just to be, to be curious and make time and the rest will, will work itself out. Okay. Yeah. Good, thank you. Yeah, one back here in the back. You can shout it out <laughs> until he gets there. Yeah, that works. So, uh, of this stuff, um, from our department, we really want to shift from the bush to the pool. Yep. Um, it strikes me in the early days of this, you could be talking to a complete lack of audience. Absolutely. I think the key to all of this is value. I've got it. The value has to be there or nobody's going to come back. And that's a, that's a great point. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. That there may be some period of time and you're doing this stuff, it's crickets. But it, it's not an overnight thing. So, you know, a lot of times those overnight successes have taken 10 or 15 years and then and it happens. So it, it won't take that long. <laughs> But there's going to be a period of, because people just don't, don't know yet. They haven't discovered it yet. It just takes time. But if you follow some of these principles, if you make it shareable and you can facilitate the conversation, that will help speed that ramp up time. 
I remember I was talking to a coworker when I started my email, my very first thing, and I told him what I was going to do. He's like, aren't you going to run out of stuff to share? I don't know. Maybe. Let's find out. And so, again, to reiterate, you don't have to have all the answers. Just get started. And you'll learn lessons along the way. You'll have questions you never thought of, but you'll never get to those questions without doing it. So, yeah, it's a great question. Thanks. Question over there, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Uh, say, I, I, I like your story, but I've been living in a world which is completely the opposite of curating external resources. Sure. I'm in the world yep. of curating internal resources. Yep. So we put something out in a learning, uh, as a learning department, and then we get feedback, and we get ratings from our users. Sure. Which tools are you going to use for that? Internally? Internally. Well, so that's a, it's, it's, it's not impossible. It's more challenging, obviously, because you're limited with what tools you can use. So you can use things like I can share links in SharePoint or Yammer or Jive or whatever tools are available to you. And, and as I was saying, without knowing what you have available, you know, if you look, maybe you, if you have some good friends in IT or something like that, you can, you can ask for some help. But really, it's, it's the mindset more than the specific tools. But I can appreciate that behind a firewall and internally, there's more friction for that stuff to move and to discover things to even to be able to curate. So I think internally, it requires a little bit more of an open culture where people are doing things like working out loud. So, hey, I discovered this guy in another country that's doing great things that are relevant over here. You know, if you don't have that and there's a lot of barriers, it's just harder to find the, the content in the first place. Tell me more about that. Because what, what, my world is the world of performance support. Sure. So what yeah. you do is you set out uh, your resources, your learning resources, uh, uh, into your uh, world where people at the moment of need can find the right information. Yep. At the moment that they see the information, you do a huge project for Bayer, for example. They have users in Brazil, in Italy, in Argentina. Mm -hmm. If a user says, hey, this is not correct, because we do it a little bit different, mm -hmm. but at that moment, yeah. And give, and give advice on yeah. how he or she will change that content. Absolutely. It goes back to the author or the learning uh, person that is responsible for that content. And at that moment, you're in a curation process. Yeah. That person is going to update yeah. that content. And with all the changes going on in, in organizations, I see a huge development of curation within organizations. Absolutely. Yeah, even more than people that are experts and reading outside. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm with you. No, no, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I totally agree. I, I think people like you who can sort of preach that gospel, so to speak, right? Like having people share what they're working on and make things visible. Because in most organizations, a lot of the stuff is hidden. I could, I could be doing the same job, you know, in the United States, in my company, and somebody's doing the exact same job over in the, in the UK. I don't even know they exist. Maybe I'm having a problem they solved last year. But it's just being able to, to make it visible in many organizations. It's not. And there's not a good way for that to happen. So there are, are much more rich sources probably externally because that's the default versus an organization. And then, you know, if it's depending on the size of your organization, you know, that adds another layer of if you're going between countries and, and all the divisions, all the stuff. So there's, it's not impossible. There are some people that are, that are, you know, doing that sort of stuff, but it's compared to the external stuff, it's relatively small. But yeah, I'm totally with you. I absolutely agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked to Lean about how it's a cycle. Yeah. How do, we, how do we measure the value of our creative curation? So, again, depends on your context, right? So one simple, this is a simple, easiest answer is as I share things, let's say I share a lot of stuff on Twitter, and I get analytics for that. I get likes and reshares and clicks and engagements. Uh, if you're in something like internally, like a Yammer, you'll have similar type statistics. So one of the things I do when I do my weekly curation is I'll look at those numbers, because I've shared a whole bunch more stuff than I'm going to put into my final newsletter. And so those type of things, like, OK, well, this one resonated. Look for more of this type of stuff, less of that. So those type things just depends on where you're at and what's available. Yeah, great question. Thanks. 
Any other questions? We've probably got time for, for one more. And I'm happy to stick around if anybody yeah. wants to hang out afterwards and anything like that. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so, um, thinking, about, thinking about the bridge, thinking about everything that we've heard from Mike so far, um, lots of really good practical advice that we can take back to the workplace. Um, it might be a tool uh, that's been highlighted. It might be an idea. Um, it might be about even just start creating in the first instance. Um, so what I'd like you to do is just take a couple of seconds. Um, you might want to tweet it. You might want to talk to the person next to you. You might want to text it to yourself or email it to yourself. But if there's something that tomorrow you're going to do differently when you go back based on what you've just heard, just take a couple of minutes just to do it right now. And while you're doing that, um, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mike. Thank you.